Okay, good afternoon. This afternoon we are getting into the core issues and ideas of our class with the help of the first bestseller of, in the history of automotive literature, The Lightning Conductor, first published in 1902, a global bestseller, at least for the Western world. First, I want to show you the new page for this week with the plans and the assignments. <clears throat> you find a series of presentations. The first three of them are just a collection of key passages with relevant language and ideas and some notes. And I use especially the first two to comment on and comment on and analyze the novel. The last one is just the reading the full set of excerpts from this novel. This week we are going to complete our viewing of the film Christine with additional scenes that are more significant We've just seen the premise and the initial evidence of the ongoing physical and mental transformation in the character of Arnie, the former nerd. In here, we'll see the full transformation and we will not be watching much from the conclusion, which is rather predictable, where Arnie becomes not only an evil character, but gets practically enslaved by the machine, doing everything that the machine wants to do to other people. Of course, I recommend that you review the presentations that were posted for this week. And the readings for next week have to do with Alfredo Testoni, a successful playwright in Italy. He was from Bologna, Italy. And he was, for the country of Italy, the author of the first play based on the automobile, called On the Automobile, which I have translated and I'm providing a series of excerpts here. The play was staged, put on stage in 1904, published only in 1907. The next year, the same author published on a journal a series of sonnets devoted to the theme of automobilism and inspired by an international race, the Coppa Florio, that was held in Bologna, actually around Bologna. And that's interesting for us because it speaks to a variety of themes, including gender and the automobile. You have the next written reflection, which is based on the same ideas I'll be discussing today. The, the title is Molly Randolph, New Woman, actually the full title that you find in here is Molly Randolph, the name of the female protagonist of the novel The Lightning Conductor from today's class. New Woman, where New Woman is code for the language of the period signifying feminist. The feminist movement was at the turn of the century between the 19th and the 20th century called the New Woman Movement proto-feminist elements, of course, we cannot call them uh, fully feminist, proto-feminist elements in the lead female character of Alice Muriel Williamson, the lightning conductor. And as usual, you find here suggestions about the length. I recommend that you include passages, and therefore, when you count the words, keep in mind that the quotes should not count towards the minimum and 
for the contents, be specific. Base your analysis of this topic on references and commentary of specific passages or episodes from this novel. As usual, I will be providing the model. I will be showing how it works, how the analysis can be conducted, plus a few suggestions, but I will not be talking extensively about this very topic, leaving it to you to review the presentations, review the readings, and develop your ideas. Of course, for the readings, for the quotes from the readings, make sure you indicate the page number, the readings, and the quotes all have uh, page references in square brackets or uh, regular parentheses. You don't find much about this. You don't find much that is relevant for this topic. So review the notes for the class. If anything to base your um, your assignment on. And again, once again, this is not a mini paper on Molly Randolph, so it's acceptable for you to have the shortest possible introduction and to have a very short conclusion or no conclusion and leave room for just a few examples that you find powerful because of what happens and also because of the language used in that. Keegan? Uh, it says right here, like, instead of like, a reflection, there's also like, an alternate for the assignment that's crossed out. Yep, decided not to, not to do that. I have, I realize I also, between the regular and the alternate assignments, I wasn't leaving myself enough room for questions for the final exam. If you, if you get my head. Yeah. Okay, so decided not to. However, if you have a strong interest in cinema, email me and we can find something for you to work on, okay? However, for the very same reason, uh, in preparation for the final exam, it would be a good idea for everyone to write about this novel because chances are there will be a question about this novel in the final exam. I'll guarantee it, but it's a safe bet, so to speak. Okay, that's it. So let me summarize briefly the novel and then we'll get to talk about it in general, about its style, and then get into the analysis of some key passages and scenes. The story is very simple. Molly Randolph is the daughter of an American millionaire. And she travels to Europe, accompanied by, since she's a young woman, not married, she's accompanied by her aunt, who's also not married, and who's supposed to be her chaperone. They, of course, from the US, get first to England, and there, Molly is first exposed, as we will see from the first few pages of the novel, to the technology of the automobile, and also introduced to the idea that automobiles are fashionable. Now, already being on this so-called grand tour of Europe was considered to be a very fashionable thing to do. In fact, the novel uses the trendy jargon of the time, which was, to do a country, they do England, they do Europe. So doing Europe was already pretty distinctive, something that made you a visible representative member of the elite. When she gets to England, however, she, see, she, she can see that that's not enough by far, that in order to really be trending, you need to have and use an automobile. So she buys one. It's not a very good automobile. The technology itself, which is described in detail, is, is already obsolete 
by that time, for example, you need to regulate the bells of the car by hand while you're driving. And already this kind of cars required a lot of operations you wouldn't be required while driving today. You have to pump the gas manually. You have sometimes to pump oil from the reservoir into the lubrication system. You have to regulate the spark. So regulate how often the spark plugs will produce a spark in, and, and, and you have to decide how, mu how much of, of, of this spark the, the, the gas, the fuel mixture needs in order to match the speed of the car. And then of course you need to put a gear, often gears were just too low and high, and, and of course the, 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 the rear uh, gear, uh, the, the gear to, to go backwards, etc. And of course, you, you have uh, brakes. So, Molly gets this old clanker of a car, even though she's trying to learn how to drive, clearly she does what was expected of someone in her position. She hires a driver. This driver is not very agreeable though, and since the driver of the time, who was called a chauffeur, both in English and in French, but also, for example, in Italian, a professional driver was a chauffeur. Since the chauffeur was also expected to maintain and to fix the car, and this car is breaking on the road a lot, and it's kind of complicated to fix, one day, the driver first gets an advance to pay for spare parts, and then, of course, with this money, he disappears. At that point, they've crossed the channel there in France, and you have these two women who are stranded, abandoned by their driver in a foreign country. They meet two guys. And one of them is the owner of a fast, more modern British car. The other is the chauffeur. There is a misunderstanding which becomes the premise to the love story of the novel. The owner, who's a British aristocrat by the name of Jack Winston, gets mistaken for the chauffeur when he offers to help the woman and he offers that his services because clearly he's already falling for her. And then in order to maintain this condition, privileged condition of proximity with the woman he's in love with, he plays the part of the humble chauffeur and he will continue on the tour of France with uh, Molly and her aunt on this old car. At some point soon enough in the book, the old car suffers an accident. Actually, it is damaged by another suitor, someone who also owned a car and who's plainly a more a member of the upper echelon of society, but someone who uh, is, is not deemed interesting by Molly. So the old car being damaged, Jack Winston pretends that his master is sending another car to let them continue on this tour. Of course, that is his own British car. They continue to travel in the south of France towards Spain and the mountains between Spain between France and Spain, then the Côte Azur, the French Riviera, and of course, this love story develops more and more. Molly realizes that she herself is falling for the driver. She knows that as the daughter of a millionaire, as a member of the upper class, that she's not supposed to feel these feelings 
for someone who would not be a suitable husband for someone like her. However, and this is one of the interesting ideas in the novel, she finds a justification for this. She finds that the very skills of Jack Winston, the fact that he's so good with the car, and of course, he will be teaching her how to drive the car, the way he behaves, the way he interacts, the way he comports himself in a variety of situations, makes him a natural aristocrat. Someone who allegedly belongs to the lower classes. However, is on a path to a speedy social mobility because of his qualities. And we'll discuss this concept of natural aristocracy, which was very popular in Europe and also in the US during that period, and a concept that was derived from Charles Darwin's ideas in the origin, origin of the species. So Jack is the fittest member of a society that is on the verge of a drastic mutation whereby the human ecosystem will be radically modified by the introduction of technology and therefore the new aristocrats, the new champions of society are exactly those who are predisposed by nature and clearly skilled and talented at handling technology. So she is aware of the social norms and the social norms tell her not to fall in love with a shuffler because it's too low in the social scale. However, she's also aware of these social changes and she can see that the shuffers belong to a class or a category, rather a group, that is quickly climbing the social ladder or are expected to have that quick climbing to happen them and therefore placing them at a superior level. The last part of the novel, they get to Italy from southern France. They drive into Italy, they go to Rome, they go farther south in Italy, and finally, we have the revelation, right? At the end of this story, the humble James, the alleged chauffeur that she has been getting closer and closer, is revealed to be a British aristocrat who's wealthy, powerful and influential in his own British society and also has all those natural qualities she has already identified, is skilled, intelligent, has leadership in social interactions. Of course, since this is a novel about the new woman, she cannot, Molly, at the end of the story, simply accept this revelation. She has to recover a position of authority, the same position she maintained through the story, because after all, this is a Cinderella story reversed, where instead of a, a young woman dressed in rags going to a party and being spotted by a powerful, influential prince, you have this powerful, rich woman falling for someone on the lower end of the social spectrum, at least apparently. So how does she recover her position of authority? Clearly, she first gets angry because Jack has lied to her, and it seems like they're breaking up because everything that happened between them during those weeks in France was all a giant lie, and then they make up and get engaged to be married. Throughout the story, clearly, we see also not only this forced proximity, these two characters being forced into close proximity by the time they spend together on the car, but this then, in time, extends to the time they spend outside of the car, 
where there are some occasions, for example, a dinner when they're not chaperoned because of a series of circumstances. So clearly, the novel is also exploring the edges of what is acceptable, what was acceptable for a woman unmarried from those times. Your question, Keegan? Um, with the uh, the English was split and then the reading of both the characters, is it done in a way that feels natural or is it like, or does it feel like it's kind of forced by the audience? Well, it, it, it's, very, it's a very quick affair. They, they argue, it seems that uh, they're done with and then within a few pages they get together again and they, everything is patched up uh, and the, uh, her father comes to Sicily, his mother comes to Sicily, so the family is there to approve, to sanction their union and clearly one of them, Molly, belongs to the American aristocracy of money and capitalism. The other Jack belongs to the traditional aristocracy of title and history from England. So in a way they're destined for each other, they're made for each other. So it's a commercial novel and they grow through the motions. It's just important to note that this is done in such a way that she can have the last word. And instead of being proposed and saying yes, since this is a reversal of Cinderella, it'll be her after they argue to say, okay, now I say yes. I decided that you can be forgiven and we can proceed with this thing. So that we see her in, in a more authoritative position. Of course, the novel has some feminist element, but it's overall still conventional. And for example, we'll see one uh, relevant example in which Molly, with Jack nearby, behaves like a Victorian woman, like a traditional woman who steps aside from a confrontation and lets the man, the knight in shining armor, intervene and save her, the damsel in distress. Okay, but only with him, and this is considered proof that they're destined to be together. Otherwise, she's feisty, strong, independent, and the technology empowers her. Just to, since I've already alluded to a series of ideas, just to complete this overview, another idea that you find prominent in the novel is technology erases the gender gap. If both men and women can be equally skilled at maneuvering, driving, operating a car, and she will become such by the end of the novel, then in the new technological society, the gender gap will not be as pronounced as in a traditional society, okay? That's another proto-feminist idea that you find in this novel. As I said, this novel inaugurates, well, it doesn't introduce the motor romance genre, but certainly it made it very popular. It showed that you can sell a lot of books with these stories. The novel sold about a couple of million books. And the writer herself, Williamson Alice, went on to write another 10 or so of these stories all similar in the uh, kind of situation that are presented and then developed and during the next 10 years between 1902 and World War One, there were many other novels written in the US, in, uh, in, in England, in France, in Italy, in Germany with the same kind of structure. Okay. Okay, so the format of the novel is a series of lectures. This was not uncommon, especially for popular literature. So you don't have the author narrating the story. What you're reading is a series of lectures. Some of the lectures are from Molly to her father. She doesn't have a mother, she's an orphan. And she's telling her father 
what's going on during her trip, beginning with their arrival in England and Molly's decision to buy a car and to continue the tour of Europe on board a car. Other letters are from Jack, or as he uh, uh, calls himself as the chauffeur, James, and he writes to a friend. So we have her point of view, his point of view, and you'll recognize this because a lot of modern day novels, especially romance novels, have adopted this kind of structure that allows for the same scene sometimes be told from different points of views. And you find a few other letters for, from Molly's father, etc. The plot is pretty much the same you find in plenty of 20th century novels and films. Girl meets boy, this time happens on the road. They fall in love while traveling together and sharing the car. It's very important to understand what it means to be in this car and what changes, right? Because think about it, aristocracy, European aristocracy, even before the automobile, they were traveling with a coachman, right? They were traveling mostly on a private carriage with horses and they had a coachman uh, driving the carriage. But you don't really find, there are very few novels or stories about a young aristocratic woman falling in love with a coachman, right? You find that now in the Anglican kind of romance novels, but not in the past. In here, what changes is not just the proximity, is the technology, the fact that a certain kind of natural leadership is required to operate the car, and therefore the chauffeur, compared to the coachman, is not just someone who may be handsome or, or strong, is also someone who has a set of skills that have been mastered by very few in society, and that seem to be very much in demand. So the chauffeur is also a social hero. So it's not just proximity, because proximity was there even when young female aristocrats were riding a carriage. But it's also interest in this man through the technology. Of course, against the odds, which is a very popular kind of situation for love stories, right, to create some kind of obstacle that prevents the lovers from just kissing each other and going to bed together from the second chapter. In this case, the odds against the characters is not the fact that they have enemies, but rather the fact that society would frown, her father would disapprove if Molly got engaged to a simple chauffeur, being herself a kind of aristocratic member of society. Of course, not only they drive, which is a new thing, so is in itself cutting edge, they do other edgy things such as have dinner unsupervised. And if this means nothing to you, you should see the number of novels from this period where an unmarried woman in love with a man doesn't even kiss him before they get engaged, okay? Which doesn't mean that this is the reality of women, men and women in society, is the reality of literature, which reflects social moralities and social values. Those were the social values, okay? The woman who's not engaged should not even kiss a guy, let alone be alone with them together. I guess you see some of them in Bridgerton. I seem to remember in the first season of Bridgerton a situation where the female protagonist is left alone with a woman and then people are saying, well, now your honor is, is tainted. So you have an idea of this kind of hierarchy of social values. So 
we find here a hint, a suggestion to an idea that you will see next week with the play from, by, by Testoni, the Italian play on the automobile. The idea that proximity in the car, especially unsupervised or partially supervised, breeds promiscuity. So the car can be seen as a dangerous social technology because it uh, uh, breaks the equilibrium that existed before whereby women who were not married, especially for the upper classes, spent a lot of time in the house. When they left the house, they were usually supervised or chaperoned. Of course, you have to have a next to last act to finish this kind of stories whereby boy loses girl just briefly going through the motion and then they get together at the end with the sanction of society because they'll get married okay and what seemed to be edgy kind of morally dangerous before is resolved and forgiven because first we have the revelation, so we know that Molly was not morally wrong in having feelings for Jack, and then we have the marriage. Okay, so we know she's an honest woman. We said the, the genre is the motto called the motto romance, and I want to remind you that there were illustrations that I posted about the third story of Loomis, the Christmas story about the guy who's on an electric taxi cab going around the block in New York, unable to declare his love and propose to a woman. In there, you find in the illustrations the electric taxi cab with Cupid, Venus's angel, and his bow and arrow in the back, representing that the car is like Cupid. Right? That's, that's the idea behind the motor romance. And we said Cinderella story with the roles reversed because she's the powerful one. He's apparently, allegedly, the humble one, and she falls in love with him against the odds. So keep in mind what it means that she's at the beginning of the story on a grand tour. The grand tour was a tradition that started in England at the end of the 16th century, whereby aristocratic Englishmen and, and members of the upper classes in Great Britain would go to France and to Italy, especially when they were younger, before they were introduced to society to get an education to know the world. Edward de Vere, for example, uh, did that. Uh, the aristocratic uh, British man who some believe to actually be the author of Shakespeare's plays. And, and this would justify why Shakespeare's plays are either set in Italy or include a lot of specific details. Think of the two gentlemen of Verona, the merchants of Venice, Romeo and Juliet, a lot of specific details about Italy when William Shakespeare from Stratford and Avon uh, never went to Italy, and so how would he know? So, by the 19th century, the Grand Tour was a ritual. It marked the passage from the teenager years to adulthood for a lot of rich or powerful people of both genders, men and women they would be sent to Europe to see places that studied about, right? Also to get a social education, right? To know how to handle social interactions and to be ready. So for the men, it was something done before they took a job or a position in the government. For a lord, it could be government, for example, for an English lord, for women before getting married, right? And 
before the technology of the automobile, already the Grand Tour was something exclusive, right? Something elitist, something that made you visibly different, that gave you, conferred a special status, okay? So keep this in mind because then this idea is extended to the automobile. If being on the Grand Tour gives you status, makes you distinctive, then doing it on the automobile makes you much more unique in this kind of society. So, how is Molly a different kind of woman? You see it from the beginning, from the first chapter. For once, she decides to purchase the car without permission from her father, who's paying for it, of course. It's her decision, very much impulse buying, consumerism is one of the themes in this novel and we'll find it in other novels as well for example a motor car divorce which we will read and analyze in two weeks or three weeks from now because uh, right after the fall break I'll be spending a class only on the final project and after that we will talk about a motor car divorce keep in mind when we say she independently purchases a car, decides on this big ticket item purchase, we have to place it in the right social context. This is the kind of independence afforded by placement of the character in the upper social classes, right? So it's not like this is a revolution for we all women. This is something that is almost customary by this time for women of the upper classes. They enjoy more freedom in society, more independence. And the same is not true for the majority of women, especially in the lower classes. Her chaperone, unmarried, reacts to this decision to buy a car with an expression that is typical of the mentality of the time, nervous prostration, which speaks to us and we'll find references to it next week also in Alfredo Testoni's play to the beliefs about female biology. This idea that um, women are very sensitive, their nervous system rather is very sensitive and, and therefore uh, this is a completely acceptable and understandable reaction because Anne-Marie is a woman. It's not just that she's new to the automobile. It's also that this is how women react or traditional women react. Whenever you see from TLC, of course, is the, from the lightning conductor and it signals a quote and you find the page in parentheses at the end, the page number. So this is the scene. She comes to England. She goes to a place for tourists, a historic town. And there she sees a series of cars because of course, cars were very popular in England by that time. And to this day, there are many collectors in England, probably more than in other countries with the very earliest models from the very earliest years of the 20th century. In fact, every year in the fall, they participate in this uh, race of sorts from London to Brighton. And you find there a, a large number of very old cars. So in this place in England, there were several automobiles. This is Molly writing to her father, starting off. And I can tell you, I felt small. From the beginning, you know that this is a new kind of narrative. What does it mean that she feels small? It's the introduction of a key idea for this and other books about the automobile that when you're talking about the culture of consumerism, not just buying things, but a society where consumerism is at the center of people's lives, what you buy determines who you are. 
what you have or what you don't have. All of a sudden, you know about this product, for Molly is the automobile, and you feel like your life is diminished, is incomplete without that product and vice versa. You feel that once you acquire that product, your life, your lifestyle, your life experiences will be different. Your self, your identity, your social identity especially, will be different, right? And, and this is the principle that you find described in passages like here, like this one here, for the first time 120 years ago. But it's the norm when you go to an influencer's account on Instagram, right? Showing products and showing places, right? Where you have experiences, places for rich tourists, exotic locales, to show this is who I am. You're nothing, but this is who I am. Maybe if you buy this expensive bag or this lipstick, maybe you'll get closer to the kind of lifestyle that I have. Okay? So I felt small is a very significant expression, just as if I were Miss Noah getting out of the ark. References to the Bible, right? To the flood. Biblical flat, Miss Noah, the wife of Noah, meaning I, I feel like I'm obsolete, I'm not trendy, I'm not part of what is cool, what is fashionable, without this item, right? So, not only you have a product that produces interesting biological effects, and the novel is full of passages where she describes the sensations of driving, of being on the car, of speed, speeding on the car, but there is also this idea, my identity is reshaped by the ownership of this technology. Without it, I'm less than a woman. With it, I'm more than the other women. And then society itself is restructured around this idea. It's not like I interact with other members of society, according to their class, according to their position of authority or influence. No. Now, if consumerism is at the center of my being, the others are there to show envy or approval for who I am with these things that I show, with the automobile, with the accessories that I have, and the same is true for the social media of today. So it's all about being admired or being hated, but simply because they cannot be me, right? So clearly, it's consumerism is also a narcissistic culture, where I become the center of the universe, and everyone else is there around me, as long as they interact with me, showing their approval for my lifestyle, including the gadgets, the devices, the clothes, the car, and everything that I have purchased. And of course, you have in the document, in the literary examples of this process, you have a simple pattern whereby you see a thing, you start imagining, your imagination runs wild about how your life would be different with it. And again, it's an automobile for Molly, it could be the iPhone 14 for you, even though your iPhone 12 is perfectly fine and, and basically is like two shirts of the same color, I, iPhone 12 and iPhone 14. No one can spot much of a difference. And it becomes an obsession something that you have to satisfy, that becomes the deepest motivation for impulse buying, but then you have to declare that there is some other more powerful motivation. So you buy a product basically because you want it, period. Whether it be a phone, a car, a trip. Then you have to make up a story to justify why you did it, and then of course you would say, well the iPhone 14 has a camera that is much more powerful, and uh, the, the night shots uh, are, are much better, 25.2% uh, better than previous models. 
but you know, and people around you know, that this is just a, an after the fact justification. Because your first decision was also ba was only based on design, right? In to show how obsessed she is with the car, she takes a snapshot with her Kodak. She's carrying this modern camera. Now, probably you haven't seen one. It's a very interesting thing. This is it, right? It was introduced in 1888, of course. Uh, you, you must know that in upstate, upstate New York, in Rochester, Kodak had a large, large factory. So this box was the first portable camera. And the way it works, of course, you have a lens here, opens for the pictures. You have a button, so it's just one click, much more uh, easier, much easier to operate than any camera. And you have this key to move the film, the roll of film after you've taken a picture to make it ready for the next picture because once you open the lens, then the next part of the roll of film gets impressed, etc. What do you do at the end? Initially, it was a hundred, enough roll, enough film for a hundred pictures. What do you do at the end? Because you can see, it's just cruise, right? You, it, it, there is no door to open it and take the film also because they thought that customers would ruin the film not knowing how to treat it, because if you expose the film again to light, then everything is ruined. No, you mail the camera to Kodak, and Kodak develops the prints, sends you the printed pictures, and sends you the camera back. Okay, so she takes a picture with this. and sends it to her father. Well, actually he says, when that photo is developed, I'll send it to you, because you know now how it works. You need to get to 100 or more pictures, because uh, that's when you develop everything. And she calls it her, your daughter's new GG, you, you got it, right? But she already has this affectionate in, in relationship with the car. So notice how the owner of the car she buys is idolized. Because if she has this interesting gadget, then he must be an interesting man. So he's defined, initially doesn't have a name. Uh, later we know his name is Cecil Lansdown. Uh, but for now it's just the gorgeous man raving, tearing, swell, even if he wasn't exactly a Jew. So already you have the suggestion that even if you're not mobility, if you know how to drive the car, then you have a more elevated stand or status in society, okay? Now, what do we know about this man? He's a champion of consumerism, of the idea that money buys you experience, right? That's what they tell you even now. You're not buying objects, you're buying experiences. Your life is going to be different. The gorgeous man had lived in France. He seems to have lived nearly everywhere. Because this is the highest kind of mobility afforded by the car. And to know everybody and everything worth knowing. And said, what a pity we couldn't do our tour on a motor car. We is Molly and her Aunt Mary. So already you, you have the dynamic that is typical of consumerism, the dynamic of exclusion. Either you have something or you don't have that something. Either you're part of the crowd who have a complete that. It doesn't have to be an automobile to understand. It could be an Instagram account with 10,000 followers or the latest phone or a bag that costs $2,000 or you're out. And if you're out, then your identity is tarnished, compromised. 
of course, you have a reference to the way Americans are seen in Europe around this time, right? Whenever they do something that is not in compliance with social norms that exist in Europe during this time, they say, well, they're Americans, so they don't know any better, okay? So just keep that in mind. After the obsession, the discovery of the technology, the obsession with the technology, you have the trial, you have the test, right? Because after all, you have to be worthy of this. Keep in mind, what is strange about this connection between consumerism and the automobile is that the automobile was a very tough sale. You have something that is not indispensable, because yes, it's marginally faster than a horse, right? But keep in mind, because you may not have the right numbers in mind, that a horse without a carriage, mind you, but just to put this into perspective, a horse, when you ride a horse, you can, you could in the past, easily travel 100 miles in a day with proper breaks, proper rest, proper nutrition and hydration, because of course otherwise the horse will keep going, but uh, it'll become exhausted or, or sick. But even with proper breaks, you can ride for 100 miles if you're strong enough for that, because probably the horse is stronger than you are. And this carrying yourself and additional weight, okay? So put a rider, put 100 or 200 pounds on a horse, you can travel 100 miles. So you have the automobile, and, and the horse will be able to travel at 10, 12 miles per hour easily, okay? Keep this uh, kind of pace for a long distance. So you have cars, during this period, they're marginally faster than a horse, but they cannot go for 100 miles without issues. They break constantly, they're notoriously unreliable, they're as, as expensive as a small house, and then it's also a product you spend a lot on, and it's not usable. You need to hire a chauffeur, because you yourself probably will not be able to drive it at least for one. So, what you see in the first chapter is the same kind of reverse psychology that was used during the time. Oh, you don't want this, it's too difficult, too expensive. And of course, when you say that to a customer, for a good number of customers, this kind of reverse psychology will, will work, right? And customers will want to prove themselves worthy of this car, right? So. You enter into a BMW, a Mercedes dealership, they'll try to be snobbish at you, right? They'll try to let you understand, probably this is not the right place for you, you should go to Toyota. But this, for a number of customers, says, well, I'll, I'll show them. I'll, I'll pull out a credit card because I don't have the money and buy this $50,000 car. Um, and it's And then, of course, to boost the desire to buy a car, you have this concept in novels like this and short stories of the natural aristocracy. Being able to drive the car, owning the car, makes you part of the elite, even if you don't necessarily are there yet in terms of membership to a social, mean a social class. So the gorgeous man tells Molly, what a pity we Molly and Mary couldn't do our tour on a motor car, and then I became flippant, right? She doesn't want to be humiliated by this British man. She's the daughter of a millionaire. So she's fallen into this trap of saying, I'll show him. And, and keep in mind that it's a terrible bargain that the car she buys is in fact old technology, the, the car will break all the time, so it, it's not a good purchase at all. Inquire, and, and she 
asks about a, a, a chauffeur, and he tells them that they ought to have a motor car and a chauffeur, then we, they, might say, like Monte Cristo, the world is mine. Monte Cristo was a novel, of course, from 1844 by Alexander Dumas, where this famous character goes to prison, escapes, finds in the island of Monte Cristo in the Tyrrhenian Sea an incredible treasure, and then goes back to France for his revenge. In this case, the world is mine is simply, as in the case of Jules Verne, you have a car, you can go anywhere, right? That is the treasure that makes you different. And notice how this character selling the car to Molly poses as an interesting character because he has a car. So you have this idea of scaffolding the identity of someone with the technology. He went on to tell of the wonderful journey he made in his car. I'm selling you a lifestyle, not a necessity, not a functional technology that allows you to move from point A to point B, but something that will make your life different. Uh, the car, which we might have noticed outside, which suggests one of the reasons why you buy a car because you'll park it in front and people will enter and say, who's that guy outside? Because it is an exotic item at this point, right? Because if you go to a restaurant, 90% of the people, if not 99, walk or take a carriage there during this period. If you have a car outside, then you're someone, you're someone else. It's like dropping names, right? You might have noticed my car outside. It seemingly was better than the other sort of car, so the product itself has to be pretty much unique. Because it is an extension of the self, you want this product to be different, so people will see that you are different. You don't want uh, the same Android phone that everyone can buy at Best Buy or, or Price Club, right? You want a phone that not so many people have to compare this to the process of consumerism and marketing uh, in, in the current times. By the time we were half through lunch, I was envying him his car. So she buys the car because she wants to be him. And feeling as if life wasn't worth living, which is like I felt small. My life is now incomplete because I have it in my mind how different my life could be with this product, and therefore I'm nothing if I don't have this product. Mind you, I'm talking about consumerism, but if you go back and rethink your decision of coming to Stony Brook, something like that could have crossed your mind, right? My life is nothing if I don't go to Harvard or to UCLA or to UC San Diego, and if I go to Stony Brook, I'll be no one, right? It's a marketing ploy that is applicable to a lot of decisions that we make today based on false assumptions or things that don't really have the value they seem to have in our reason. My wife wasn't worth living because I couldn't have it to play with. Okay. And so they go for a test. Aunt Mary is there. Notice the beginning of a social change when we're talking about edging the norms applied to women. What is Aunt Mary for if not to make all the things I want to do and otherwise couldn't strictly progress? It's a complete reversal of what a chaperone should be. The chaperone during this time, a proper chaperone, is supposed to prevent the person they chaperone from doing stop them from doing what is not appropriate for a young unmarried woman from the upper classes. She transforms this into a completely different reasoning. I can do anything as long as she's there. 
to chaperone her. But her aunt's presence doesn't make certain things proper or right for a woman. But this is the dynamic of the story, right? And Mary's there, so she'll do things that wouldn't be good enough for uh, female members of society from that period. So they go for the trial, and immediately you have the first of many experiences of the car, right? It was heavenly. I know how a bird feels now because of the air, because of the sensation of flying. Keep in mind, it's an open cockpit car, so you have a lot of air coming at you, right? And you're very high for this kind of car that she describes we are sitting very high on the ground. We're talking about three feet or more on the ground. So I've had quite time enough by the end of the trip to determine that I want a gift card if it could be got. So impulse buy, right? This is a novel about consumerism. You try something, you want it now. And this is true of most items that are popular, right? If not now, of course, I have uh, Prime or some other kind of shipping delivered to my house within 24 hours, right? But mostly is I want it now. And this is new for the time. And we'll find it in other books. In Luigi Balzini's book, they go at some point there in Irkutsk, in Asia, Central Asia, near Russia, near. Well, it's a big territory, right? And they offer a ride to a merchant. The merchant goes with them for a few hours and says, I want a car like yours, and I want it now. When I get home, I will go to the office, send a telegram to the factory in Italy, and have one shipped to me right away. This is new. This was not the logic applied to products before technological. Of course, after everything she said poetically about the car, she says, it has very convenient accessories. Keep this in mind whenever your father, your mother, your aunt, your cousin comes back with a new car they've just purchased. And in order to justify, to make it appear that they make the right decision by buying this car, they'll show you how many cup holders the car is or the dashboard that is different, or some other finicky accessory. And to this day, dealerships have cars that have a lot of accessories. You never find a bare bone car, right, on the lot. It's not just to get more money from you, but also because this is the logic. You want the car, and then because of the accessory, you will say, I spent a lot of time, a lot of money, but Look at this that I have. Your car doesn't have it, right? Uh, I, I can move my armrest back and forth. So you have something that costs the producer ten dollars, but justifies the purchase of a fifty thousand dollars car instead of a twenty-five thousand dollars car, or some other kind of that. <coughs> so you find it already at work in this literature. And right away, they continue on their journey with this car, and they feel different. They're different from the others. Their identities in public are different. After that, after they ship the car to France, because of course, in order to get there with the car, they have to put the car on a ship. I hope we shed so much and see a railroad train except from a long distance automobiles forever i say say i mine in particular the, the train is the transportation vector from for everyone else for the populace i'm different i go on a car so it's like someone saying oh i'm not flying american airlines never again for me i, I fly my private jet right so i'm different from And this was the end of the first presentation. Let me introduce the next for 
the next 10 minutes or, or so. So the first set of passages here testify to the idea that I spoke about before, derived from Charles Darwin theories about evolution and the origin of the species. This is not something Darwin is directly responsible for. It just so happened during the next decades, especially during the last 25 years of the 19th century and then the 20th century as well, that some people said, if what Charles Darwin said about animals is true, then it must be true about people in the community as well. Because yes, allegedly, people, humans, belong to a larger species. And of course, the assumption was that every race was biologically different, but within the same race as well, Darwin provided poor sociology to people who thought, if I take any community, a nation, a city, a local community, and I see a variety of skills, various degrees of social success, then it could be because of lack of justice, lack of mobility, eh, or it could be because those people are naturally, biologically, predisposed to their job and their station in society. So, if someone is a scientist or a doctor, it's not simply because they work hard and they could afford an education. No, they were born with skills they developed, but they were predisposed to get to that place in society. Whereas a porter, just to mention a typical example from the anthropology books of the time, porters, Italian porters were actually studied by Lombroso, a, a famous criminologist and anthropologist, Lombroso's assumption is porters are born porters. They become porters and they carry heavy uh, weights because nature made them ready for that, predisposed for that. And this was developed to an extreme with people all over the Western world saying general education is wrong because not everyone can become a doctor or an engineer or a scientist. So it's a waste of money, public money, if we insist on having people study beyond fifth grade or third grade, right? A basic education, anyone can get there, but high school, university, nature made only some people able to complete that kind of education successfully, okay? That was the idea. How is this idea applied to the story? As I suggested before, you have the daughter of an American millionaire, American, American aristocracy, falling in love for someone she believes to be just a drive, humble chauffeur. So she feels guilty, she feels she should remove herself from certain dangerous romantic situations. At the same time, observing her love, her romantic companion, uh, uh, James Jack, uh, she observes that he has the skills, the qualities, that would place him into this idea of a natural aristocracy. That is to say, he is the fittest member of society that Darwin talked about. And being fittest comprises also his ability to operate the car. So look at these statements. Brown, 
that's the assumed name of Jack Winston. He calls himself James Brown when he offers his services to Molly as a chauffeur. Brown is a very good looking, and, and think this is Molly writing to her father. Brown is a very good looking fellow. Okay, nothing wrong about that. But then she adds, too good looking for a mere chauffeur. Meaning, physiognomy itself indicates that if he doesn't belong to the aristocracy, he should be there. In a Darwinian context or framework or line of thinking, is someone who should be moved up or should be able to move up in society. <clears throat> Again, she repeats further on, one can help noticing these things even in one's chauffeur, meaning is a chauffeur, yes, but his quality point to a different station in society. He belongs to this natural aristocracy, someone who's predisposed to be a leader. If he were a chauffeur, one might certainly take him for a gentleman. So you have a society with classes rigidly separated at this point and limited mobility, but then you have this notion that one's station in society should be based on their qualities. And from this point of view, James is deserving of a different class and a different respect. Some things are really are a pity, but never mind where she's criticizing mildly class, a classic society. Okay? So this is when James confronts another suitor who would like to have a liaison with Molly, perhaps even marry her, but she, he, he is officially a member of the upper classes, but doesn't deserve Molly. It's not good enough for her. And during this confrontation, uh, as you will see from the reading, Jack shows a lot of leadership and a lot of power, a lot of courage, a lot of nerve, right? He goes in and says silence to this guy and makes her jump. So even physically she reacts to his leadership, his masculinity. And again, to make this concept more visible, she adds, it was he, Jack, slash James, who looked the gentleman and Monsieur Tyron, the rich suitor with another card, the cat, meaning the scout. Okay? So, placement in society, social places mean little if you do have the character, if you do have the fiber, the qualities to become a leader. I'll just go on for a few minutes while you're signing the attendance. Again, he, James Brown, really ought to have been a gentleman. It's such a waste of good material, the Lord using him for a chauffeur when any common staff would have done uh, for that. Meaning, why should be a, a chauffeur when he has these qualities? And these ideas are echoed by socialists from the period, for example, the Fabian Society in England during this period has the same ideas, meaning British society is wasting a lot of talents because we're not educating the people from the lower classes who deserve to have access to education because they may be more intelligent, more brilliant, more skilled than the members of the aristocracy who go, go to Eton, to Oxford and Cambridge, etc. Okay, so this defines the idea of natural aristocracy. You can be aristocratic by birth, or you could just have the qualities that indicate you should be a leader in society. And this is the case of James. Of course, James is also an aristocrat in real life. She doesn't know it, but he is. And in fact, you may think that this idea of natural aristocracy is a revolution in the societies of Western Europe during this time, when it is not, we'll find the same disappointing uh, uh, revelation 
in another book, the book by Luigi Barzini, where the protagonist, the hero of this adventure with this car going, uh, traveling for two months from Beijing to Paris, is a member of the Italian aristocracy, but he's also a member of the natural aristocracy. So the idea of natural aristocracy is not revolutionary because it finds evidence in the fact that even within the aristocracy, you find a lot of people who are aristocrats and show it physically, mentally, bio biologically. Meaning that if this is true, then even aristocrats are such in society because they deserved it. Because they have something different. Okay, so it's not a revolutionary idea as well uh, at all. 